bow your heads for prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank and praise you. We that are born again can call you our Father. Lord, we pray for those that have not received you, Lord, as their Father, that they would come to a knowledge of the truth and have that honor and privilege. Even, Lord, we pray if anyone is in the house today who do not know you as Father, who have not been born again, we just pray that they would give their life to you because, Father, we are living in the last days and it's just too risky not to be born again. So we thank and praise you, Lord, for the great commission that you've left with us that not only as we go out, Father God, but whoever we run into, Lord, we can give them the gospel. So now, Father God, we just want to pray your blessing upon the service this morning. We pray for a super anointing upon our pastor. We pray, Lord God, that you would just anoint him from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. And every word that proceedeth out of his mouth would be under the demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit. And your word would not return to you void, but it would accomplish everything, Father, you're sending it out to do. We pray an anointing upon our praise and worship, team and musician. Father God, we pray that everything we do in this house today would bring honor and glory to your name. Anything that is not of you, Father God, we just pray, Lord God, that you would uh, correct it in the name of Jesus. Because, Father, we want to be pleasing to you. And we thank and praise you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to come before you this morning with our praise and worship and celebration, Lord God, in music. So we just dedicate this time, Father God, to you in everything, Lord God, that we thank we do and say in Jesus name I pray amen and amen praise the Lord hey, can you guys stand while we intentionally go before the throne of God this morning and praise the worship it is a, oh no <laughs> is everybody awake this morning and excited about Jesus amen so we're going to go ahead and pray this morning. I love praise. 
him. Hallelujah. God is so good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is good, y'all. God is good. How many of y'all know he reigns forever? He reigns forever. Hallelujah. Can y'all clap for him?
us and not of him out of us. So we just, we, we, we want to be pure. We want to walk in the footsteps of his. Take it out of me. Take it out. 
Stand to your feet if you would. Give God a hand praise this morning. Amen. How many of you are glad to be in the house this morning? Amen, amen, amen. Let us begin with our declaration of transformation this morning. Repeat this with us. Today I will be transformed by the power of God's word. It defines me, empowers me, and enriches me as I apply it to every area of my life. My mind is open, my heart is receptive, and I surrender my will to the Holy Spirit's control. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, come in to this place now. We submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. As the song said, if there be anything within us, Lord God, that's not pleasing to you, take it out of us, Lord. None of us know the day or the time that we will leave, Lord God. So we pray that every soul that walked into this place may see things perhaps just a little differently, Lord God. To take advantage of the time that you have given to us, to love one another, Lord God, to let small and silly things go by. Help us to walk out with a mind with the great commission to share the grace and mercy that you have given to each and every one of us. We thank you for Jesus. and We honor you in this time and in this place. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree, say amen and amen. And as you take your seat, just reach over to somebody and tell them good morning. Love on them a little bit. Tell them it's good to see you. Say good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you would, as you find your seat, open your Bibles to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. We have been in a series in this book for several weeks now, and we have been approaching the book of Jonah from the perspective of callings, the callings of God. 
And most of the time when we talk about callings, we automatically assume that we're talking about a position or a role. Most of the time when you hear the word call it in church, we think of the pastor. The Lord has called this person to be a pastor. The Lord has called this person to a deacon or whatever it is. But I want to try to expand that definition for you when we think of calling and that a calling is not just a role. A calling is any time that God requests or asks or assigns you to do something. It's not a position. It's not a title. It's any time. And when you think of it that way, God is calling or requesting or assigning you to do something every day. There's not a day that you wake up. If you are in the body of Christ, God is constantly calling you to do something. He's constantly assigning you to do something. So, for example, uh, your calling from God may be to wake up in the morning and start to read and study your Bible a little more. How many know that God will call you sometime to do that? It, it's not a position. It's, it's just God calling out to you, requesting that you do something. For some of us, God may be requiring you today before you go home that you'll see somebody on the side of the road. And anybody know that sometimes God will just put something in your spirit to just witness to that person or just to go over there and talk to that person. That, that's a calling. It's not a position. It's just an urge. It's a, it's a request. It's a command of God to do something that he wants done. God's call to you may be to stop watching some programs that you are watching that, that, that aren't good for you. It has some, some profanity and some things in it that he doesn't want you to be watching. It may be a relationship that you are in that God's calling you or requesting that you walk away from it because it's toxic and it's not a good thing. Sometimes the calling of God is just for you to start coming to church regularly and stop watching us online all the time. How I many know that God likes you to come and fellowship with the body every once in a while, right? God is always calling and requesting for us to do things. The problem is not the call of God. The problem is, is that we always don't like to do what we're told to do. Come on, somebody. See, the more I studied the book of Jonah, I found out that we're not that much different from Jonah. You see, it's, it's very easy for us in 2019 to come in in our sanctimonious, pious look and sit in our pew and sit as the position of judge and judge Jonah and judge everybody in the Bible and to point out all their flaws and all their failures and not recognize that we're actually guilty of some of the same stuff. Because the truth of the matter is every person in here has heard the voice of God tell you to do something and you flat out looked at God and told him, no, I don't want to do that. Is anybody going to be honest this morning? And that's what got Jonah in trouble. In the first two chapters of Jonah, God came to Jonah and he called him. He, he assigned him. He requested that Jonah go to Nineveh and preach to them, to cry out to them and tell them about their wickedness. But when Jonah heard what God wanted him to do, Jonah said, I don't want to do that. I don't like those people and I don't want to go there. And so the Bible says that Jonah ran from God. And when he ran, the Bible says that God sent the storm. For those of you who are joining us, that God sent a storm. And the storm really was a punishment to Jonah. It was, it was a spanking for Jonah. Y'all know when our children don't do what they're supposed to do, you go get that belt and, and you, you put that spanking on them, right? When Jonah ran, he essentially, God was disciplining them with a the little spanking. But how many know that spankings don't always work for your children? Anybody got some children where you can spank them and spank them and spank them, but they're so stubborn that the spanker don't work? And so what God had to do was when the spanking didn't work, he had to amp up the pressure some. And so what he did, he had the mariners to get tired of Jonah and to throw him off the boat and throw him into the raging sea in the water. And when the raging sea in the water didn't work, he had to amp it up some more. So he sent a fish and prepared a fish to come and swallow him. But when the fish didn't work and he got swallowed, Jonah still didn't want to change. He left him in the fish, in the belly of the fish for three days, the Bible says, and three nights. And at the end of three days and three nights, Jonah finally reached his breaking point. He finally reached the point to where he recognized that doing it my way is not the best way. I have got to turn from the way that I'm going and start doing what God has told me to do. Amen. And the question for all of us is, is what is it going to take for you to recognize that you got to start doing things God's way and not your way? Is it going to take the belly of the well experience or can you learn from the storm? 
Some of us don't learn from the storm, so God has to keep amping up the pressure and amping up the pressure in order to get you to turn from the way that you're going to go back to what God has told you to do. Now, as we ended chapter 2, the Bible says that Jonah, after spending three days and three nights in the belly of the well, that he finally recognized that what he was doing was wrong and he had to turn. And the Bible says that after Jonah finally recognized it and after he repented inside the belly of the well, the Bible says that God spoke to the fish. I'm just giving a recap that God spoke to the fish and the, sp- and the fish vomited him out of his belly and brought him to dry land. Do you all remember? So now we're picking up there in chapter three. And the Bible says that Jonah has now been vomited on, up on the dry land. Watch this. But he has a problem. Because he's been in the belly of the, of the fish for three days and three nights. And how many know if you've been in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, you, you, you're a little sweaty. You, you probably smell a little fishy. I saw some commentators that noted that he, his skin was no doubt a bleached white from being in the acids of the, of the fish, that it would turn his skin a full bleach white. So he probably was looking like, like uh, I'm trying to think of the, the phraseology, but albino or, or whatever it is, the way, where, he, where he pure white. Listen, and so he's getting out of this fish, but I think even perhaps, I want you to put yourself in Jonah's position, perhaps he's beginning to question whether or not God can ever even use him again. You see, because he's been in the well for so long, maybe he's beginning to question because of my past and because of the things that I have done and because I've messed up so bad and because I've been running for God for so long and because God has had to bring me to the point of almost death. Can God even use me anymore to serve him in his kingdom anymore? You see, Jonah was a prophet of God. He was used by God before. And now God has had to take the prophet that he normally sent to go tell everybody his will. And he's had to break him almost to the point of death. And the question that Jonah is struggling with is after all that I've done, can God still use me as a prophet to do his will? You have to remember in the text, if you go back and read it later, God never told Jonah that he was going to do anything with him again. So as far as Jonah is concerned, maybe he just got vomited up on the shore. But God never said, I'm vomiting you up on the shore to go do something else. He's thinking that it's all over. And maybe some of us in here today are feeling some of the same way. That maybe you've wandered from God for so long and you're beginning to question whether or not God could even still use you anymore. Perhaps your past has been so messed up. You've gotten out and you've been wandering into some sin and you've gotten into some bad stuff and God has had to take you to the, the woodshed. Has God ever had to take somebody to the woodshed where he's had to spank you a little bit and, and you're beginning to wonder, can God still use me? Anybody ever felt like that? That my sin, I've been wondering from God. Y'all just don't understand what I've been doing. I've been in sin, Pastor. I've been living the wrong way. And now I'm just struggling with, can God do anything with me? And I believe Jonah has a word of encouragement for you this morning, that he is a God of second chances. Look at your neighbor and say, God is a God of second chances. Let me give you four things here from the text. Turn your Bibles to Jonah chapter 3. The first thing I want you to see is is that although we have rebelled against God, he is a God of second chances. Somebody ought to say hallelujah on that. Look there in verse 1. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah what? The second time. Now don't miss that. It says he came to him a second time, so that means he must have come a first time. Now watch this. One would think that after you have rebelled against God, one would think that after you have flat out told God, no, I'm not doing it. One would think that after you have run from God and God has had to send the storm and he's had to throw you in the water, he's had to arrange this fish. After all that Jonah had did, he had messed up. He was a prophet of God. If anybody should have known better, it should have been Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. He was in the school of prophets. He spoke on behalf of God. And yet, after all this stuff that he did, somebody would think that God wouldn't wouldn't use a person like that. Come on, somebody. If somebody had done all that, would you want to bring them back on your team again? Uh, if, If you had somebody on your team at your job, and you a manager and you working, and you told them to do something, 
and they flat out told you to your face, I ain't doing it. And then they ran off the job. And then you had to go through HR and you had to do all the HR stuff because, you know, you can't just fire people nowadays. You got to go through all the process. You got to do all that stuff before you can fire them. Watch this. And then when you get ready to fire them, before you get ready to kick their butt out the door, they come in and they humble themselves and they repent. How many of you would take them back on your team? Come on, somebody. The truth is none of y'all would take them on your team. Because you would say that they have disqualified themselves from being on your team. And some of us feel that way today, that because of your past, because of things that you've done, that you're now disqualified from serving from God. I'm not qualified. You, you just don't understand, Pastor, of how much sin that, I can, that I've been living in. But the truth of the matter is, I came to encourage you that nobody is qualified to serve on God's team. I know you messed up. Truth of the matter is... You looking at somebody who messed up royally. Boy, I know y'all looking at me all sanctimonious and holy, but I just got to be honest. Uh, I, if God judged me based off of my past, I shouldn't be your pastor. I'm not afraid to say it. I mean, when I was in high school and I was in college, you know, I did some stuff. I mean, I used to hang out with my cousin John. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm not going to speak for him I'm not going to speak for John <laughs> see that ought to let you know who you're close to because you can always ping on them but here's the thing I'm not going to speak for John I'm just going to speak for myself I did some stuff that, that I shouldn't have been doing I went to some places I should have never, I should have never went to. I'm not ashamed to say it. I mean, I was up in there breaking that thing. Y'all don't even know. Come on, we all got a pass. We, we all not done our stuff. And the truth of the matter is, I'm just trying to talk to whoever that is. None of us in here are qualified to be on God's team. The, the truth of the matter is, I shouldn't even be pastoring now as it is. You know why? Because I ran for God for years. My daddy came and told me that God wanted me to pastor in 2002. And I told him the devil is a liar. I told him you need to go back in the prayer room and pray some more because I don't believe God told you that. I, I, I'm doing good on my job. I'm making plenty of money. My wife and I are doing good. Um, you know, if you've been serving at your job for 22 years, same company, if you've been doing what you're supposed to do, you know, chances are you're at the very top of your pay scale, right? I I'm doing good. Things are going good for me. My career is going on, and you want me to leave my job to come take less money to come deal with all this stuff that I see you struggling with? Your hair already gray. You're trying to turn my gray? The devil is a liar. Watch this. And I ran from God from 2002 to 2010. Over eight years. It took eight years before I decided to come and do the whole pastor thing and all that type of stuff that he was doing. And, and, and that may not seem like a big deal to you, but you got to understand, anytime God calls you or tells you to do something and you don't do it, you're in sin. I'm talking to somebody, you may not recognize it. Anytime God prompts you, he tells you to do something, and you don't do it, you're actually living or doing or acting in sin. Do you remember when God, what God told Adam? He said, Adam, don't eat off of this tree. The day you eat off of this tree, you shall what? Why? Because when you do what I tell you not to do, you actually have sinned against me. Right? And the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of is, watch this, so the understanding should be anytime God tells me to do something and I choose not to do it, I'm old death. Now, I, know, I know you may not think about it like that, but anytime God instructs you, he tells you to do something and you decide, you know what, I don't really feel like doing that. Quite frankly, you are in a state of rebellion, of resisting what God has told you to do. 
Now, today, you may not feel like it's a big idea. It's a big deal. You know, God tells me to do something, and I don't really want to do it. Well, it's no really big deal. You know, God just looks up over it, and we get up over it. But no, 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 no. Every time you sin, quite frankly, we should be doomed to death. And when God gives us a second chance, somebody ought to say hallelujah that God would even give you a second chance in the first place. Why? Y'all remember what happened to Lucifer when he messed up? Come on. See, I'm, I, I just want to refresh this. See, we think that God is supposed to give us second chances. No, 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 no. We are the exception to the rule. God doesn't normally give anybody a second chance. When Lucifer messed up one time, anybody know how many chances did Lucifer get? One? Two? Zero. He offended God, and that was it. A third of the angels were immediately judged and sentenced to death, and that's what you and I are owed. So quite frankly, every one of us in here, there's only one reason why every one of us in here are still alive today. You know why? It's one word. It's called grace. Oh, somebody ought to say amen and hallelujah on that. Whoever that person is I'm talking about, you need to understand. If you're struggling with, am I even qualified? You got to understand. There's one word why we're all qualified, and that's grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of your It is the gift of God, not of works. Why? Lest somebody should be able to watch this. So the only reason why you and I are still here is because of grace. Notice it says, we are saved by grace. What does he mean by saved? He says we're saved from something. What is it that I'm being saved from? You're being saved from the wrath that you really should be getting. The wrath of God so that whenever we sin, we're supposed to be instantly judged and killed. But for some reason that I have no idea, God has decided to give the human race grace. Man, that's awesome. We're old death, but he gives us grace. What is grace? It is unmerited favor. It's, it's, it's his favor. For some reason, God favors us. He says, you didn't earn it. You couldn't buy it. He says, it's a, it's a, it's a gift that, that you were owed something else, but I'm giving you grace. I'm giving you, I'm giving you favor. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, I'm favored. God favors me. The reason why you're not dead is because God favors you. And you may be questioning whether or not I'm qualified or because of my past, I'm so messed up and I've done a lot of bad stuff. Maybe God can't use it, but you need to understand whenever the devil comes to you with that type of thinking that you need to say to yourself that, but God favors me. You might have been messed up and you might be doomed, but my God favors me. And if I'm willing to repent, God's willing to give me a second chance. So the first thing is, is that God favors us. The second thing that Jonah teaches us is that when you mess up, you must go back and complete your first assignment before you progress to the next one. Hear me. Some people have messed up. Watch this. Look look at verse 2. He says, arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Watch this. Sometimes when you mess up and God asks you to do something that you don't want to do, you think just because I repent and I say that I'm sorry for not wanting to do what I didn't want to do, that after I repent, God allows me to go to something else that I do want to do. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody saying amen. You know that's the truth, that sometimes you know God tells you to do something, and I don't really want to do that, so if I just repent and don't do it, then God is going to let me squeeze by that one, and I can go on to the next thing that I actually do want to do. It doesn't work like that. No, no, no. You got to first go back and do what God originally told you to do before you get to your next assignment. Do you hear what the Bible says? He says, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and do what? And preach to it the message what? Does that sound familiar? 
Do you know why that sounds familiar? Because it's the first thing that he told him in, in, in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. His assignment was to go to Nineveh and preach to them whatever God told them to go preach. Watch this. And the lesson here is, is that you don't progress to your first assignment until you finish the, the next assignment until you finish the first assignment. Come on, somebody. I don't know who it is that I'm speaking to. You, God gave you an original assignment, and you're ready to go to the next one. And God said, uh-uh, before you go here, you got to first do what I told you to do. See, see we don't like that. See, I, I remember when I was working in the private sector, I had this boss. And this boss um, was a very hard man on me. He, 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 he fought with me every which way I went. And um, I was trying to get into leadership. Quite frankly, I felt that I should have already been in leadership. I should have been in leadership a long time ago. Isn't it not obvious? I'm doing my job. I'm real good. I'm one of the best that it is at the company. You should already have me. I should have been there a long time ago. I don't see what the big problem is. And he would not promote me. Can you believe it? Sit your hand down. Watch this. And so... I, I, I'm upset with him, and, and I'm resisting him. And so I go to my dad, and I'm like, Dad, man, you know, we're sitting there talking, we're close, and I'm telling him about everything that's going on. And, 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 and he's listening, he said, well, son, you know, I think what God would have you to do is just to submit to authority. I said, the devil is a liar. Did you hear what I said? I've been telling you everything that this man has been doing and all this drama that's going on. He said, I hear all that. But I think God wants to teach you how to submit to authority. I say, man, I threw up my set on him, John. I say, man, are you, are you listening to me at all? Are you, are you on his side? Are you on my side? What's going on? Watch this. And so I tried to resist in every which way that I could. I tried to go around him. I tried to do everything. But did you know that God would never promote me until I got to the point where I submitted to authority? Watch this. I had to first go back and do what God first told me to do before I would ever be exalted to the next level. And some of us on your jobs right now, the reason why God won't promote you is because you won't do the first thing that God told you to do. And that is to learn how to submit to authority. You know how ridiculous it is? Why would anybody want you on their team if you don't listen anyway? I didn't see that then, but now, now that I'm through it, I guess I got to understand and so you got to go back and do what God says. Listen, for whoever that is, don't expect God to promote you until you do what you've first been told to do. Watch this. So if God told you to um, wake up and read and study your Bible or to go to a small group, don't expect him to exalt you and promote you to preach in the gospel. Come on, somebody. Why? Because you hadn't first done the first thing. If God told you to go witness to somebody, don't expect him to exalt you to go do something else because you haven't done the first thing. If God told you to tithe, if God told you to give, don't expect him to put more money in your pocket if you hadn't first done the... Man, the amens that went down. <laughs> See, the problem is, if you're not faithful in small things, why do you think God is going to give you more? You got to do what God says first. So don't expect God. Listen, whoever I'm speaking to, do what God originally told you to do. Amen. Stop worrying about high positions and exalted positions and all these first things. And just go back and do what God first told you to do in the first place. Amen. Second thing. Third thing. When you do what God tells you to do, he will do miracles. Watch this. When you do what God assigns you to do, he will do miracles. What did God originally tell Jonah to do here in the text? He told him to go to Nineveh and tell the people what he told them to say. Amen. Do you see that in verse 2? Well, what is it that he told Jonah to say? Look there in verses 3 through 4. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. It's a very big city. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Watch this. So what did God tell Jonah to say? Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Watch this. If you read the book of Jonah, that's all he said the entire book, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 
That's his whole message. That's his whole sermon. That's all he said when he went into Nineveh. Watch this. Three, eight words. Watch this. So Jonah went through all the stuff that he went through. He went through the storm. He running. He being thrown into the sea. He in the belly of the fish. He in there three days and three nights. All because of eight words. He didn't want to go say eight words. That was his assignment. And how many of you know that sometimes we tend to complicate the assignment God gives us? You, you can get so busy with making excuses and dealing with the challenges that come with it to where it prevents you from doing what God told you to do in the first place. And all he said was go in there and tell them people eight words. He never told them to go in there and worry about what the people said. He never told them to go in there and say that you got to get all the people saved. He never told Jonah to go in there and do anything but say eight words. And for some of us, you're, you're making your calling way too complicated. See, when God tells you to teach Sunday school, well, what if the children don't listen? And what if this? And what if that? And what if they don't accept me and I'm not qualified? God never told you anything about any of that. All he said was go and teach Sunday school. What if what if God told me to usher? Whatever it is that God told you to do, you got to learn to just do what God says do and stop worrying about people. See, that's a word for somebody is you've been struggling with because of your past, what are people going to say about me? You know, I, you know, some people not seen me out in the club and, and I've been running away for years and, and all of this type of stuff. And you know how people talk when you get in and you start trying to serve God and, and they try to make it real complicated for you and everybody snickering and everybody talking underneath their breath and everybody talking about you. And the word I got from God was, was stop worrying about what everybody talking about you and just go say your eight words. Yeah. Stop making it so complicated. People are going to talk about you whether you do something or whether you don't do something. This man is running, going through all this simply for eight words. But watch what happens when he says this eight word. Watch this. When you say your eight words, God can do miracles. Look at what happened. In verses uh, 5 through 9, Watch what happened. After he said it, the people of Nineveh what? Do you see that? They believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Think about that now. This is a, this is a Gentile heathen city. This ain't Israel. This ain't no Jewish people. This is a Gentile city, and this man went into the city and just did what God told him to do, say eight words, and the entire city is starting to come to Christ. It says, from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word even came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with fat cloths and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way, from the violence that is in his hand. Who can tell if God will turn and relent? And turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Watch this. So people believed, they repented, they put on sackcloth, they did all these different things. Why? Why did they do that? Because one man took on his assignment and went into the city and said eight words. Watch this. He wasn't responsible for anybody getting saved. He wasn't responsible for anything else but going in, doing his assignment. And how many know that sometimes we complicate the things of God so much by worrying about everything else when all God told you to do was this? I run into this with our teachers all the time and, and our Sunday school teachers and everybody. People just don't listen. All you were told to do was go put on the carnival and double the youth ministry and do that. And that's all y'all supposed to do. How simple is that? Dolores, just go double the youth ministry and it's simple. Go do it. But pastor, but pastor, but, 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 but,
don't do what God told you to do. This is a word for Dolores. I'm trying to encourage her. <laughs> but here's the word. Yeah, I, I know I'm, I'm somebody going to say something to me at the end of this, but uh, here's the word. Just do what God told you to do. Stop worrying about everybody else. I had to learn that as a pastor that it's not my job to save anybody. My job is to come in and just teach what God told me to teach on Sunday and to leave the rest to him. John 6, says, it's not me that saves anybody, but the Holy Spirit draws them. If God doesn't draw you, then you're not going to get saved, at least not here. Right? So just do what God tells you to do. And when you do it, miracles begin to happen. I got one more point and I'm getting ready to close. I'm, I'm, I'm closing right now. One more point. The last one is, is our obedience or disobedience to the assignment of God has eternal consequences. If you ain't heard nothing else that I say, I want you to just, just pay attention. Our obedience or lack of ob- obedience to whatever God tells us has eternal consequences. Watch this. Most of the time, if you're not careful, you can think that when God tells you to do something, if you don't do it, it's not a big deal. How many, how many sometimes, and you don't, you might as well not raise your hand because you know it's the truth, um, that when God tells you to do something, give, serve, whatever it is, if I don't do it, it's no big deal. But one of the things you have to understand is everything that God tells us to do has an eternal consequence. Listen, listen carefully. Think of it this way. God came to Jonah. Think, think with me. He came to Jonah, and he gave him an assignment. His assignment was go to Nineveh and preach, right? You all remember that? We have now seen what happened when Jonah went and did what God told him to do. When he went and preached the eight words that God told him to do, the Bible says that the greatest revival in in recorded history to where the entire city, supposedly, people argue about that, but the entire city has come to know Christ, right? A revival came. Here's the question that I have for you. What if during the time when Jonah was resisting God, What if during the time when he was running to Tarshish and was on the ship and was in the storm? What if during the time to where the mariners had to throw him off the ship and now he's swimming in the water? What what if during the time when Jonah is swallowed by the fish and he's inside the belly of the fish for three days? What if during that time where he's resisting God and not doing what God told him to do, someone in Nineveh died? What if during that time to where he's resisting and doing what God told him to do? Because remember, when he went and did what God told him to do, God did a miracle and the whole city got saved. But it was after he did what God told him to do. What happened if while he's resisting God and not doing what God told him to do and running away from God, somebody in that city died? Do you know where they're living? That person is living in hell and they could have been saved. Instead of it taking three days and three nights for him to get there, if he would have just went and did what God told him to do, perhaps that person that died then could have got saved. Watch this. Here's the thing. So what is that saying? It's saying whenever God tells you to do something, listen, there is eternal consequences to that thing. Every assignment, everything that God tells you to do is significant. That means if you serve here at the church and you are a greeter and usher, That role that you do, whether or not you take that assignment, may have eternal consequences for somebody. You know why? Because when someone walks into the church, if you're not at your assignment, if you're not doing your assignment, and if you're not doing your assignment with excellence, they walk into the church and nobody greets them. Nobody makes them feel welcome. And so they come into service. And instead of the word having its effect, they still trying to figure out this church ain't got no love in it. Come on, somebody. It doesn't matter what the assignment is. It has eternal complication, eternal potential. If you clean the church here at the church, how many of you know that it's cleaning the church is important? If the church ain't clean, if it's not tidy, someone walks in and instead of paying attention to the worship, they're so distracted by the trash all over the floor and your pews are dirty. How can I worship God in a place like this? And so because you're not doing your assignment, somebody may miss out on their opportunity to come to know God. Every assignment is important. God has called you to teach Sunday school or to be a teacher. I don't want to do that, Pastor. 
And God, it takes you five, ten years before you finally start to do what God has told you to do. And all in the meantime, you've had, I don't know how many countless children come through there. And nobody was able or prepared to teach them. Watch this. And God can take you back and say, I told you on this date to do it. And you resisted me year after year after year. And all of these people that I sent towards your area didn't come to know me because of your foolishness. Because you resisted like Jonah. You refused to do what I was calling you to do. Who am I talking to? That God has called you to do some things and you resist and you got all these excuses. You got all these reasons why you don't want to do what God has told you to do. Listen, and it's not just about you. There is somebody that God wants you to minister through. And if you don't take the assignment, they don't get what they need. Some of us, it's all about us. If I don't want to do it, then it don't get done. Watch this. And you can have that attitude. But one day you're going to stand before God and he's going to bring us back and say, all of these people could have gotten saved if you would have just stayed on your post. I leave you with this question. What would happen if all the people in the church just got busy with their assignment? One man went in and did what God told him to do change the whole city. What would happen if everybody watching me on live stream and in this building, if everybody just stopped making excuses, if everybody just stopped worrying about what everybody else is going to say, if everybody just stopped worrying about whether I'm qualified and all that type of stuff, you can get qualified to do whatever it is that you want to do. If we stop making excuses and say, I'm going to get busy and do what God has called me to do, Imagine how many lives could potentially be changed if you just decided to get up out your seat and you know that they have needs up over there teaching children and you or whatever it is. There's always something that you can do. What if we just got busy and said, I want to serve Jesus and I'm not going to let anything else stop me from doing it anymore. That is my prayer for you today. Stop making excuses. Stop letting your past control what you do. I've met people even here in this church. And we've had discussions about how something that happened in their past was holding them for service. Maybe it was a divorce. Maybe it was something else. And, you know, sometimes in the church, there's an attitude that once certain things happen, it disqualifies you from everything. And there may be some of that that it applies. But let me tell you this, that all of us got a past. We were talking about this in Sunday school. Everybody in here has got something that they have done. And you have to stop being the judge of everybody and condemning everybody. Man, stop letting people be your God and let him be God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak to that person here, Lord, who may have wandered from you, who may have made some bad decisions, who, like Jonah, may have been resisting the call. We thank you, Father, for loving us and giving your grace towards us. Because the truth of the matter is, anytime we disobey you in anything, whether it be big or small, we're in sin. And all sin is punishable by death. But, Father, we are thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, coming to pay the price, paying the price for our sins, as Isaiah 53, that he bore our sicknesses and our disease, our infirmities, everything was placed upon him, that we don't have to bear it. But let us not take that grace for granted. Let us not take it for advantage, Lord God, and just say, well, I have so many opportunities and God just keeps forgiving me because at some point that grace is going to run out. And so we, as we are here, brothers and sisters, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I just want to encourage you here today. Man, woman, brother, sister, don't waste your whole life letting your past dictate your future. Yeah, you might have done some stuff in the past. Who hasn't? You look at any character in the Bible, they they are all flawed. But I believe God is calling you today to say, you know what? He has told me that if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just 
to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Not some, all unrighteousness. That means all the bad decisions. That means all of my mistakes. That means all of my errors. That means all the times that I slept around. That means all the times that I walked around in rebellion. That means all the time that I did drugs. That means all the time that I got high. It means, it means all the time that I was rebellious towards my parents. It means all the time that I haven't tithed. It means all the time that I haven't come to church. It means all the time that I've walked in unforgiveness. It means all the time that I've run from him. He says that all I have to do is just repent and that he forgives me of all of it. And it doesn't matter if other people don't forgive me. He says he will forgive me. And if God forgives him, then why are you carrying all that stuff on your back? You don't do that stuff anymore. Even if you are, you still can change. I speak it over you right now in the name of Jesus Christ and for his glory. All chains to be broken in the name of Jesus over your mind, over your spirit, over your mind, over your will, over your emotions. And that you will be free to do whatever God leads you to do. Be listening to his voice because he will tell you. You don't need somebody to tell you. Just get to reading your Bible and praying and God will tell you exactly what he wants you to do. You don't need everybody to tell you. Just get quiet and listen. He'll tell you what he wants you to do. Stop letting everybody cloud everything and just be obedient. Do what he tells you to do. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, very quickly, the first thing is to hear that voice is you need to decide to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. If you're here today and you haven't,